name is Renee Logic. This paper is work that I did with David Marsh, who is a postdoc at the Perimeter Institute in Canada, Daniel Grin, who is a postdoc at the Coverley Institute for Cosmological Physics at the University of Chicago, and Pedro Ferreira, who is a professor in the physics department at the University of Oxford. My name is David Marsh, Daddy, and I want to tell you about our paper. As cosmologists, what we're trying to do is understand what is the universe made of, how is it going to change with time, and what is its cosmic history? We're looking to constrain particles of a certain mass, and we're looking to constrain what their energy density is contributing to the universe. Constraining particles of, of a given mass with a given tool, you're limited in the range of masses you can look at by what that tool is. And in cosmology, the range of masses that we're limited to is 10 to the minus 33 electron volts up to about 10 to the minus 22 electron volts. And why is that? That's because the length scales in cosmology that, that really define what you mean by cosmology are about a gigaparsec, which is about the size of the visible universe, down to a few kiloparsecs, which is about the size of a typical galaxy. Now let's think about these, about these masses. What does it mean? What does a, an electron volt mean in terms of mass as well? To give, to give you an idea, the mass of the proton is around 900 mega electron volts. So when you think about normal constraints of dark matter, like normal um, constraints on Earth using direct attraction to dark matter, they're normally sensitive to masses of around the GeV or so of so-called WIMPs. And that's because what they're using is they're using nuclear recoil. So, you know, so the scale of the process is roughly set by the mass of the nucleus, and the rest of the mass of the nucleus is a void of the mass of the proton. We want to understand if axions exist, can we tell what masses they have, and can we tell how those masses are going to change the universe around us? Now, this is really important because we're trying to understand the problem of dark matter and dark energy. The key thing about this work is that depending on the mass they have, the axions will behave either like dark matter or like dark energy. In fact, they will transition. We have what we call an equation of motion for the universe, and that describes um, how the axion is moving with time, this axion field. And at some point, depending on the mass of the axion, um, the Hubble scale will be roughly three times the mass of the axion. When this happens, the axion starts to oscillate. The field oscillates, and the axion behaves more like a dark matter component. It starts clustering in the way that we expect for dark matter. This is why it's really important that we see um, what the axion is going to do to our cosmological observables. One of the main observables that we use is the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is light that's been traveling towards us since around 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And this light comes from what we call the surface of lost scattering and is really the furthest that we can look. We measure it from space using the Planck satellite and we used this data in our analysis. We also used data from ground-based telescopes, like the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. The axion is changing the space around it, and depending on its mass, and this is going to have an effect on the cosmic microwave background radiation. What we actually do is we measure this radiation on the sky, we measure the temperature, and we see how that temperature changes in different parts of the sky. We call that the power spectrum. In addition to the cosmic microwave background radiation, we can actually measure the clustering of galaxies. So we use data from the Wiggles uh, experiment that measured bright galaxies that are emitting a lot of radiation in the blue part of the optical spectrum. And this allows you to measure these galaxies out to high redshift. By measuring the clustering of these galaxies, you can constrain the axion parameters. If the axion oscillates at a particular time, it's going to stop the clustering of structure in the universe. And so it will damp or push down the power spectrum, depending on its mass. And we are able to determine how much of the cosmic pie is made up of axions of certain masses, or how much are they allowed to be. So the cosmic pie is kind of typically something like 25% dark matter, something like 5% uh, baryons, that's ordinary matter, and something like 70% dark energy. When we talk about dark matter, we mean something uh, that is collisionless, 
So it doesn't interact very strongly, but it behaves um, under gravity like things we know and love. When I talk about dark energy, I mean something very different. Um, I'm talking about a substance in the universe that doesn't cluster. So it doesn't clump together under gravity and it doesn't form structures in the same way. The key thing about this work is that depending on the mass they have, the axions will behave either like dark matter or like dark energy. So what proportion of this whole dark sector could be made up of axions of different masses? On the x-axis, the log of the mass of the axiom. You saw this kind of u-shaped plot. On the y-axis, we're going to have what we call the axion fraction. The fraction, omega a, it's the amount of axions. Divided by the energy of the um, axions and cold dark matter. And so we got this u-shaped plot. And we found that over a large range of masses for axions, over seven orders of magnitude, that means over ten, a factor of 10 million in mass, 10 to the minus 32 to about 10 to the minus 25 electron volts. The axions are only allowed to be a very small amount of the energy density, and that's about 5%. So in terms of this pi, we said that at most, a small segment, about this large, could be made up of axions over this particular mass range. If we think about the lowest mass, these are axions that are so light that they've never begun to oscillate. So for the entire age of the universe, they have been lighter than the Hubble minus. This means that they look like dark energy. We can't tell them apart from dark energy. So they can make up all of the dark energy in the universe. On the other side of the graph, we have axions behaving like dark matter. We've identified these two distinct worlds. And what that means is, as long as axions are heavier than 10 to the minus 25 EV, they can be all of the dark matter. On the other hand, we identified this wall here, at 10 to the minus 32 EV. And here, the axions are allowed to be, they are allowed to be all of the dark energy. So that is, for masses less than 10 to the minus 32 EV. In this paper, we looked at what kind of particle physics models are viable to tell us about the dark matter and the dark energy. We learned what the dark matter and the dark energy weren't, and we also found out some things that they were allowed to be. We showed that if the dark matter is made up of axions, then it has to satisfy pretty stringent constraints on the masses. There's a whole range of masses that it's just not allowed to be. There are many ways forward. We can add new data sets to the mix and continue to probe this space. We can also look at new cosmological observables. So rather than just measuring the CMB and large scale structure, we can ask, what does CMB lensing tell us about axions, for example? One other way forward here is related to the hypothesis in string theory that there could be not just one axion field with a fixed mass, but many different axion fields with all different masses. This is the scenario known as the string axiverse. So we could go forward by trying to compute the effects on cosmology of not just the single axion with a fixed mass that we looked at, but the effects of having many axions all at once. This paper is one more step in trying to understand the axiverse and its predictions for cosmology.